Stay near the downtown. Mm -hmm. We'll some other neighborhoods. But uh, <coughs> Southern Caribbean, we've been from Aruba up to, to, up to St. Thomas and St. Yeah. John's. Mm -hmm. I've heard St. Thomas, Thomas is pretty bad now. St. John's is much better. Yeah. I love St. John's. St. Thomas, <laughs> St. Thomas is trashed by the Navy. Those Navy guys. They have yeah. Seven o'clock at this time, I would like to call the July 10th, 2012 Planning Board meeting to order. The first item on the agenda are minutes from June 12th, 19th, and 26th. Mr. Secretary. Uh, the we submitted the minutes out to the last meeting. Everyone had a chance to look at them. I think that we had comments on one issue, and other than that, they were all approved. So I move uh, we approve the minutes as amended. Second. Okay, are there any comments? Uh, are there further comments other than those already made? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. The minutes uh, are accepted. Thank Chair? you. Thank you. Uh, approval not required. Oh, excuse me. I just, was news to me, I read in the paper today that the draft minutes are now going to be posted on the internet. So our procedures could change. If that's the way it's going to be, that if our draft minutes are posted, then everyone just has to look at them and then immediately send their comments to me, and I'll make sure they get revised. So that, uh, that's what I hope. That's what's what's happening. It said some of them. Is that your understanding, uh, Brian? Yeah. Let, let me find out precisely what the uh, the memo says. <laughs> as we say, uh, there are goods and bad things about posting draft minutes. Yeah, they're always available in the office. Um, let me find out what's going on. Well, with what I read in the Enterprise, it says it's happening. I think it's because some uh, committees have chosen to adopt that. Okay. So then I'm just wondering, do we have a choice or not? That was my, my question. Do we want to stay with our own procedures or do we want to? I, I think you probably have a choice. Okay. Uh, the open meeting law says you have to make them available within such, such a time frame of your meeting. I think it's 10 days. Uh, anyone who wants a copy of your minutes in any form, it's a public document, gets them immediately. Mm -hmm. So let me find out what the memo says. Bring and, it up next. And, next and we can discuss it right through next meeting. But what you want to do as an elected board, I think you have a little bit more uh, flexibility. Melanie, are you aware of any of this? No, no Melanie is not involved. So that would be my responsibility. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jim, for that. And Brian, if you can get back to us on that, that'd be great. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is an approval. Oh, so Approvals not required. Uh, uh, we don't have any of those, do we, Brian, tonight? There are no approval not required, please. We don't have any. Correct. Okay. The next item on the agenda is a public hearing continuation. Uh, we have information from our staff. Okay. I'd ask the board for a motion to continue this public hearing to September the 11th, 2012, at 7 p.m. here in the town hall. So moved. Okay. Uh, second. Second. Okay. And then could you just give us an explanation on that, Brian? Remember, this was re this was referred to the Cape Cod Commission. Uh, well, the procedural glitch in that we had actually already advertised your hearing uh, for this before that referral was made. They have taken jurisdiction. So this is a pro form. This is a procedural continuation to September until such time as we find exactly what it is the Cape Cod Commission and the applicant will be doing or not doing, uh, we'll have better, want some better information for you then. But for procedural purposes, you need to continue your hearing, which was opened, I believe, back uh, in uh, June or July. Okay. Any other questions for, for Brian? Okay. Thank you. So I need a motion then to continue the hearing until September. The move to second. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. September uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. September 11th. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. Thanks, Pat. The next item on the agenda is discussion. The wind energy system draft zoning bylaw. We have a copy of that that we are working on. Correct. <coughs> and... Yeah. Mine, mine, I'll be all set. Okay. Um, as, you, as you know, we have discussed 
the first portion of it and also held a public hearing on the first portion of it. And we are now going to start uh, discussing the um, the paragraph which be which begins with application requirements, and this is the um, uh, performance standards that we're discussing at this time. <clears throat> so if everybody would refer to that portion of the bylaw beginning with application requirements. I'm going to read it just for the benefit of the audience and TV audience and, and the audience that's here and then we'll begin our discussion. The application requirements. This is in draft form. In addition to the requirements found in um, paragraph 301, 1 through 15, that's the part of our bylaw that deals with special permits, I uh, believe. Isn't that? It's actually your rules and regulations regarding special permits. Right. Yeah, right. It's not the bylaw. Said, right. so. Applications for a special permit under this article shall include the following, unless a waiver is granted by the uh, <clears throat> the special permit granting authority, which is us. The applicant shall also submit such material that the special permit granting authority may reasonably require to review the application to determine compliance with the provisions of this article. The first bullet under this paragraph is a mandatory pre-application meeting prior to submittal <coughs> applications to the special permitting granting authority shall be reviewed by the planning department. A second bullet, names and addresses of property owners within the public outreach area as defined. So I'm going to stop there and ask if there's any comments or questions as far as that is concerned. <coughs> Mr. Hearing, hearing none. Actually, we, we will also be introducing in that paragraph uh, other application requirements. We're working on an, a preliminary intercon interconnect agreement. In other words, we would like to see up front an inter an interconnect agreement, at least at a preliminary stage, or an indication from the utility company that what they're proposing to do has a high chance of moving forward. Because we don't want you to be wasting your time doing <coughs> these applications and going through the process when, in fact, NSTAR or the utility company isn't going to be uh, receptive to what it is they're proposing to do. So we are working on another bullet point in regards to some sort of preliminary statement from the utility company in regards to the interconnect agreement. Okay. From the utility department, okay. Okay. Um, the next um, sub, -par the next uh, sub uh, paragraph is site plan details. <clears throat> All parcels and occupied structures within the public outreach area they need to be on the site plan. All existing structures on the site property. Three, location of proposed turbine foundation and all appurtenances, ground equipment, transmission equipment, fencing, exterior lighting, etc. Four, distance between the foundation and property lines. Five, all overhead wires. Six, extents, the extent of clearing necessary or installation. I'm going to stop there and ask if there are comments, questions, or additions uh, for that portion. Doug. So they're going to be required to do a site plan, including <coughs> other properties? That doesn't seem to be. Yep. A site plan including what? Other properties beyond their own. Yeah, well, you, you may not require a full uh, you know, land survey. <coughs> But we want them to identify, just as we do on a locust map or a GIS level map, you know, uh, the public outreach area and all occupied structures. On their um, site plan itself for the property that they own or will be uh, developing, you will want, you know, the, your rules and regulations regarding special permits. That's that 301. Right. 
require you know land court level accuracy. Right, on their own property. On their own property. And for their other properties, we might use town existing records. I think at that point you would be reasonable to accept, you know, uh, other other plans that might be available or GIS records or assessors records. Okay. Right. Yeah. Again and again, remember the reason the reason why I have uh, up here in the first procedural paragraph, yeah. You know, Yes, you're required to do that unless you waive it. So if you have a small application or they have uh, information that's already available, you can use your discretion. And that's why we also have, if we miss something, we have a fail-safe, uh, we have a fail-safe uh, paragraph that, you know, uh, you, you can ask for information reasonable to the application. Um, at our last meeting, the word adjacent in one was removed, and I do think it should be removed because that limits it to just the adjacent parcel. Mine was crossed out. So Correct. I, adjacent it, should be crossed out. Mine was in the prior one, but it's not the one that was in our packet today. Oh, okay. So that's why I'm bringing so it up. If you're looking at a copy that has in the first item there all, all adjacent <coughs> parcels, it should be all parcels. <coughs> Further comments or questions on that? portion of the draft. The next portion, engineering details, tower and foundation plans, only monotube designs are permitted for large wind energy systems, which means you can't have a lattice work type of structure, it's got to be a tube. Wind energy system specifications, including the manufacturer and model rotator diameter and tower height, actual power consumption over two years for principal uses on the lot, Me meteorological tower data for 12 months. <clears throat> Comments or questions on that, on that portion? Pat. And the way this is stated, it would indicate, that the way I read it, that you have to have the tower there and Paul brought up last time that sometimes that information is already known from other measurements in the area. And that was correct, wasn't it, Paul? Yes. So you, you think that perhaps we don't, Excuse me. perhaps we ought to say that that is necessary, however it is derived. So which, which, which bullet are you, are you referring to then? That is the Met Tower data. Oh, the Met Tower, oh, the last bullet. Okay, mm -hmm. Brian. But that, that's why we have in your beginning paragraph. You know, here are your requirements, unless you waive them. So someone might come in with some information that's comparable. You can waive the the Met Tower data in favor of that, or you may not want to. So it leaves you with that uh, authority. That's why we have that Get categorical okay, right. statement up the front. Okay. It covers everything. Or perhaps a simple way of doing it, just say represent mid tower data. I, I, I would just have mid tower data unless you say whatever you submit to us is okay. Is right. Otherwise, you, you, it's an upfront requirement because you may have a very large system <coughs> all the way down to a very small system. And the, but, but the applicant has the ability to petition you that the information they have is equal. Or better, and then you and your discretion may waive that based on what you find in that particular application. Okay. Is, is the way I would go. I'm I'm hearing a little feedback, and I'm wondering if it's coming from that mic. No, I can hear Seems myself. I can hear this. I'm getting your feedback from when I speak. Is anybody else hearing that? No, I'm hearing it lady. generally, oh, yeah. not yeah. from any particular person. It's a general. Okay. Maybe we should, Frank. If you're this one away, Frank, if you're out in the uh, in the control room, would you like to come out here and maybe help us with this? I think this was loose because I just moved this. Yeah. Yeah. The it. feedback is gone now. Yeah. It's gone now. Yeah. Okay. Is it? Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, let's try that. Okay. I think I'm hearing a little bit myself. I'll get them from uh, come up here and take a look. I think. Okay. We might have just solved I think this one. It might have been one mic, but I'll we'll see. Seem to get I'm better so when I wiggle around. Am I still hearing it? Or no? 
No. No, I'm getting a little <coughs> back feet. Okay. Okay. To it. I'm trying to adjust the okay, yeah. okay, okay, thank you. But I'll give him a call down there with the pros. Okay, okay, fine. All right. Okay. Um, all right, so then are we finished with engineering details? Any other further comments on engineering details? The next subparagraph, operating details. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. We were talking about certification. Is that coming in engineering details? Specifications are one thing, but how about the certifications? I'm sorry, uh, Paul. What, what, your uh, item two is wind energy system specifications. But there's no wind system. energy system specifications, including manufacturer and model rotor diameter and tower height is, and what else did you want? Are we going to require certifications? Yeah, we had talked about possibly uh, oh, certification mentioning of either the small wind uh, energy, uh, I forgot the name right now. Yeah. But not, not yet. Not yet. Okay. We wouldn't yeah. recommend that at this point. The but certification no. would be, in other words, the a written statement from the manufacturer no, certifying that this is the case. Is that what you it mean? Would actually be th can I? What uh, I think it would actually be a third party certification council type of independent rating. Uh, independent rather than, certification rather than just the manufacturers. Like because we talked about the fact. Is that, that your uh, understanding of it, Brian? Of yeah, think, certification? Yeah, I think you need to you need to allow the applicant to submit their information. And if the board feels as though you need third-party corroboration, then you bring it in. Okay. But I wouldn't ask for it up front. Okay. That. And that would be an option of ours, in other words. Correct. Okay. You, could, you, you okay with that, Paul? It? When would you ask for it? Then? During during the process, the, during the review. But you, you you allow the applicant to come <coughs> in with their their story, their information, their application to you. And if you feel as though you need to have some kind of information corroborated, then you can then hire an expert or they can hire an expert to give you a third party opinion. And at this point in time, I think I would leave that in the review process, not in the app, not an application type level information. Doug, but it seems like we're missing an opportunity to help them choose better equipment up front, because then we're going to be they're going to have already made a lot of plans based on this equipment that may not be certified. Right now, when we say certified, who, certified by who? Well, I had recommended the one, the Small Wind Rating Energy uh, Council. I, I would not go with any one group's certification of any equipment. This, and I wouldn't advise this board to surrender any of your authority to, to approve equipment to a third party at this point as part of the application process. It's information you may want to use to render a decision, but I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't utilize it at this point as a must-have until uh, such time as we get a better better handle on that. You allow someone to come in, and make a case, state their their reasoning for being in front of the board, their opinion as to why their equipment is great. Uh, it's going to be doing X, Y, Z. It's going to be able to produce so much power and such a fashion, and then you can examine their evidence. But right now, my advice to the board is you shouldn't be surrendering any of your authority to any third party claimants. <coughs> Doug? I don't understand how it would be surrendering any, any authority. It's just recommending uh, independent rated, better quality equipment. We, let's not, that, not that we're going to have to say, oh, if it's certified, then we have to accept it. You know, I would. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even go there in an application process. In other words, a third, a third party. Um, let me see if I can come up with an analogy. Uh, radio equipment, radio towers. We wouldn't be out there saying uh, we prefer to see this type of equipment certified by whomever. You don't have a preference. You have. You're a tab blank tablet and you're going to come in and listen to this person's evidence uh, without any preconceptions about who might be rating it or certifying it or whatnot. You may use that as part of your decision making process, but you have to let the applicant get in the batter's box without uh, any chilling effect with regards to what you may perceive as a preferred uh, model. So I would just go with what you have today 
And if they bring something in that's completely unknown to you, or you don't feel comfortable with, you can always ask a third-party rating system analyst or whatever to give you an opinion, whether it's these people or somebody else. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it as part of your application. But the chance is good that <clears throat> if it's either certified or not certified, I mean, I've only found the one agency in Massachusetts that provides the list of certified. Just saying it seems like they're going to put a lot of investment to get ready and then find out they've chosen uncertified and they didn't know about it. That's the only thing I'm thinking of. I guess I might okay. be wrong. Well, no, you're, no, I hear what you're saying. But I'm just saying that as a, as a jury, you just, you want to see these people come in with what they believe is uh, a machine that's going to produce this energy that meets your standards. And I, you really don't want to be telling them up front you prefer machines certified by any other group. Let them, let them make that determination on their own. They may say, oh, gee whiz, I think these folks, uh, these machines are certified by these folks. That's, that's information we could put in front of the, the Special Permit Granting Authority to make our case. Don't you make the case for them. Well, I guess I can accept Unless that. it's an experimental model, they're going to have the certification. And they can provide that very easily. Let, when let I them, ask them to go out and design a, a model specific for a facility in Falmouth and go out and certify it as an independent laboratory, it's not what they're asking for. But they have a standard right. turbine that seems to fit the, the site conditions that we're talking about. Right. They most likely have a certification that they can provide as well as the specifications. Generally, that's it, what you provide. Right. Same as it would be no different than uh, we, we want some power equipment certified by underwriting laboratories. No. You, you want them to come in with their power equipment, let them make their case, and you might say to yourselves, well, we want underwriting laboratories. We want an opinion from whatever it might be. Uh, I would make it part of the review process. I wouldn't make it part of the upfront mandatory application or even advisable application materials. Not yet. So let me see if I can come up to speed a little bit. Uh, at this point in time, I would recommend you don't do this. Hmm. They very well may come in and say, here, I've, here's my wind turbine energy system, and it's certified. They might just say that you know, right up front, and, what? and then, then, then we're home free. But whether or not it's required or not, I think it's, it appears to me like it's sort of an open issue here, right, at this point. And since we're in a draft situation, maybe you want to think about that a little bit more and come back and revisit it later. Pat? Well, what I can do then is, as an aside, maybe somewhere in their engineering details, we can have an aside, you know, parenthetically, you know, certifications. You know, but I wouldn't make it a, a mandatory certified machine. Let them, let them come in and make that case to you. Yeah, I hear what Brian is saying because throughout, whenever we do something, we don't tell somebody what kind of equipment to use. If, as Brian <coughs> said, we're the jury. And so if we specify, well, you're going to be certified and there's one agency in Massachusetts we just don't do that as a board. Mm -hmm. um, it's outside of what we should be doing. I'm not saying just only use that one. I'm just saying no. that's just one example. I understand that, but there probably aren't going to be a whole lot more than one in Massachusetts that mm -hmm. would be doing that. Mm -hmm. And I hear what Doug is saying. Mm -hmm. uh, procedurally, probably not here. Uh, during your review, that's a perfectly legitimate question. Has anyone? Has any certifica certification agencies anywhere on God's green earth given you the blessings? That's mm -hmm. a perfectly legitimate question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and we may get some comments uh, about that particular issue. All right, and I'll look into uh, that some more for too. our uh, at our uh, hearing. Okay, I'd like to move on then uh, to the next uh, sub paragraph, which is operating details. The responsibility, responsible party <clears throat> entity with legal responsibility for operations, emergency contact, and procedures. 
And we are we are working on the language. So this language is a little awkward. Remember, it's just a draft, draft, draft. But we are going to fix that up a little bit. So yeah, that, that probably needs. Some but it gives you an idea that, that what it is information. Okay. Again, this is at the information point that they need to deliver to you as part of their package. Legal responsibility for operations and emergency contact procedures. <coughs> the next part: noise model modeling to determine existing ambient and build conditions, including. So that, that, there's some language there that right. it's a little bit confusing, but it says manufacturers' documentation of the sound levels generated under various wind conditions at given distances. Measurements of ambient sound levels under typical daytime and nighttime conditions. The conditions under which the background sound levels were measured, as well as the frequency and duration of these measurements, shall be specified. The town reserves the right to employ the services of their own acoustical expert at the expense of the applicant. Then flicker modeling. Can I make a comment? Comment you want to stop on mod noise yep, modeling? Yeah, okay, yeah, go ahead, go ahead Pat. Okay. Um, I'm curious as to how detailed we can or should get in specifying how, when, where the modeling, the measurements will be taken. Some of the bylaws I've looked at go on for three pages with the specifications. Some are just very brief and would probably be easier to circumvent in how they're doing the um, measurement taking. And so I'd like to get a sense of everybody here how specific they want us to get in this document. I'm not saying I want us to decide tonight that you're going to take it at 2 a.m., um, that sort of thing. but. How specific do you think we should be? It, is this an appropriate question, Brian? There are various models out there. We've made it relatively generic. If mm -hmm. you're not comfortable, that's why we're here. Jim? I would think, uh, if it can be done, I'd like the, the modeling to be site-specific, at least adjusted for the topography and the immediate area they're going, and not taking in a model that works everywhere in the country. Generic's okay if you're so many fit away, this is it. We already know that, you know, you know, our weather, there's many other things. So I'd like to see the model, whatever model they use, at least some adjustments were made to be for a specific site and, and not just take a generic model and pop it in and, and that's, which will cover a lot of the things that you brought up. At. Exactly, it will. That's the kind of response that <coughs> I was trying to ferret out here. Oh, um, a comment too. Yeah, I, I'm, I had put modeling for terrain, um, under the in, in the, on the next page under clearing, so I'm I'm, under, I'm understanding what you're saying. Um, okay, then I'll. And any other call? Oh, yes, Paul. One of the issues with noise modeling is the seasonal variations too. Mm -hmm. If you do it in February, it's quite different than August. Mm -hmm. So it's only nighttime; it's a seasonal variation. Right. Uh, there are studies under when you see the turbines, you're more effective. Well, the wind conditions vary seasonally. Yes, all right. Which, so seasonal, choppiness effect. Add seasonal variations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Other comments uh, before we go on to flicker? Yep. Uh, uh, just curious because I'm scanning it and I probably looked at it and read right over it, but I know comments we got um, were that we have to look more for instead of just distances, we have to look for engineering performance. And so I'm wondering if we're going to do that, and noise is one of the critical complaints here, if not the critical complaint. Um, are we going to anywhere in here specify shall not exceed and, and give more definition than the state standard of 10 dBA above ambient? Does anybody feel we should be doing that or not? I think if... Uh the state standards were actually held held up, we might not have problems. I think that they've been exceeded, and we've only seen a couple of actual tests because the 
testing seems to be so hard to get done because there's so many issues that come up. So I think with more testing, we might find that more exceed, uh, excesses were, were there to be found. So I would say the state. I'm just asking this because I think it's part of this discussion that yeah. needs to be done. My first Im impression would be that the state has probably got the right numbers, but we just didn't actually, we don't have the right uh, setup to mm -hmm. meet those numbers. <coughs> it could be more. We could go a little stronger, I suppose. Well, well, the question comes up when you're dealing with this is what kind of a community, I'm going generic here more, what kind of a community do we want to be? Right now we've got a 40 dBA noise limit for various things. And we know that the background noise exceeds that when they were doing the measurements during the day, I believe, and even at night. So if we have greater than a 40 dBA background, are we not being truthful in our bylaws? Do, how do we want to handle this? Because do we want to be a quieter community? Or do we want to encourage, what are they called, cigar or cigarette boats out on the sound that drive me crazy as they go racing around? Um, you motorcycles. Know, which, you motorcycles, yeah, OK. I mean, the craziness with those things only lasts for a certain amount of time, but do we want to specify a noise level that we really don't want to have exceeded? Because every time you add something to the background noise, it increases the ambient level. Where are we going to draw a line at, for ambient? Before, 28 became a four-lane highway, and before we had the amount of traffic we currently have, ambient is considerably different. <coughs> Woods Hole Road in the summer, and I'll tell you last week, is way different than it is in the winter. So how are we going to handle this? Doug? We really need a comprehensive noise bylaw. We don't really have in place either. But isn't that, going to be a, isn't that going to be something that the department, uh, the uh, health department is going to deal with? Aren't they dealing with noise? I don't know. I think they're more into the health effects of, yeah. of uh, various well, things. Noise. But the noise as a nuisance and a, right. a nu noise nuisance bylaw uh -huh. would probably come from us. That is ours. And maybe we could just turn <coughs> it out and then refer to it. So, well, this, what do you, what do you, you, you want to ask the staff to do something here, mm -hmm. Pat, what, or what? Well, what I quickly looked up, you remember, Bob, I think you've got a copy of it, I don't know about Jim, the Minnesota study, which was put out in 2009, and I quickly looked that up, and they recognize infrasound, and they recognize that that's probably what is upsetting people and what they're looking at is when you go to 40 to 45 dBA up to 25 percent of the people are then annoyed. I'll use the term annoyed rather than a nuisance factor here. <coughs> Sleep interruption um, when it's greater than 45 dBA occurs. So I'm just pulling this out of the Minnesota study. Let's see, that was on page 17 in here. And that study incorporated an awful lot of the literature that we have seen with the literature surveys from the state. I think all of that was probably in there. It incorporated, uh, Dr. McCunney gave the talk at the Voc Tech School, and he's a noise expert. He and um, four other people at the behest of the Canadian and the American Wind Energy Group uh, commissioned them to do a worldwide literature survey. And they didn't find a, a lot of health effects. Um, but we're dealing with limited studies, as you saw from our own state study. They keep citing the same four or five or six studies over and over again. 
Um, so, what do we want to do here? How do we want to set that? This is, I'm thinking, a very big question. And there are other ways that we can handle this. We can say, okay, people aren't really terribly annoyed during the daytime because the noise levels increase. And in the summer, the noise levels around here increase tremendously. What we were hearing when we, those of us who went to the Board of Health meeting or watched it on, on television, what we were hearing is that it is a sleep disturbance that creates so much of the trouble so many of the health effects, a lot of that, my understanding is, can be directly a result of lack of sleep, the symptomology that was described. And I don't know about the rest of you, but when I don't get my sleep, I'm nasty. So, you know, I, I think we're, we can handle it in a different way. We can handle it similarly to what is being done with the wind turbines now, we could say, okay, from the hours of whatever it is, they're doing 7 p.m. Maybe we want to do 10 p.m. or something like that to 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. The turbines, if they provide more than X, will be shut off. That's another way of handling it so that people can get their sleep. Or we can specify a certain DBA level, as we currently have in our bylaws, which may not be realistic. But my concern is every time we add something new, we increase the ambient background. Do we want to be a city in noise? And that's a huge question I think we have to look at when we're deciding on this issue here. Other comments? I got one. Doug? So I think that would be <coughs> a nice spot that you could let it run faster in the daytime and keep it quieter at night. But I don't know if that would really be practical because now, I mean, the town is trying to be a responsible steward, but these are going to be independently run by individuals who might be less inclined to be so careful with the adjustments. I think we should only permit them for the maximum amount of noise that they're going to make at full speed, not bothering anyone. And we don't have to worry about whether or not they're following our rules. Just like if we put a no left turn sign and people are turning left anyway, we can't control it after it's up. But it's a good thought, but I don't think it's going to work. I, I'm just putting out <coughs> possibilities. And if we say, okay, we're going to permit it based upon maximum speed, running at 100% in the worst wind conditions, and you've got to maintain this sound mm -hmm. level, that might cut out all turbines in the future, as we know them, turbines as we know them. Well, I don't know. I hope that's not the case, but I think we have to take that chance and plan it that way. Okay. Well, well you've got, you know, Jim. <clears throat> I think uh, we need to deal with noise separately. I think it's important to have a part of this bylaw say it doesn't exceed the town standards or by noise bylaw, but we might need to revisit that and because I don't want to create a special noise permit level for wind turbines. I think it needs to be the same for everybody across the town. And, and, and we should have in it that the permits do not violate our, our, our noise bylaws and then make sure our noise bylaws are updated and, and working properly. I because I do, you know, we, have, we do have problems with motorcycles, cigarette boats, the other things have all, all been brought up. And I think we've got to deal with noise and separately and then tie the two together, just like we say it has to conform with other bylaws, <coughs> you know what I mean? So I don't want to make a special noise component of the wind turbine bylaw. I think it should be town in general. I agree. That sounds good to me, but I mean, other comments? If that'll work. <laughs> that's, that's an idea. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what is the status of, a, of our noise bylaw at this point? I'm trying to recall. what. What do we have in place right now? I think it's limited in scope and not very descriptive. It's do we have any? Do we have anything like that? You have Brian? a general nuisance clause. Or this is a zoning bylaw, yeah. and you have a general nuisance clause right. in there that you can't have be objectionable uh, or excessive. Uh, there are no numeric thresholds. It's up to the building commission to determine whether or not your coffee maker in Woods Hole is objectionable. All right. Uh, because of the smells 
or it's up to the building commission to determine uh, whatever it is your 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 lathe, your your saw, whatever it is, is is buzzing too loud at night and being objectionable to to nearby residences on Carlson Lane. Uh, so there are no delimitations in the bylaw today is because it's because there's such a wide variety of uses out there that you couldn't really put one number. In this instance, however, you have a land use that you are regulating uh, and that you may have a performance standard for. No different than if, in fact, we had uh, a coal-fired power plant and we said the emissions from your stack cannot exceed 15 parts per million of sulfur dioxide on any given day. So I think you have that authority here to regulate this particular land use with its particular effects, uh, irregardless of what other bylaws or other competent jurisdictions are saying. See what I'm saying? Uh, so I would focus, I guess we've jumped ahead here a few sections. Um, if you want to start talking about specific performance standards, we have those further on the bylaw, and we can talk about that a little bit more. But you have that authority, and I wouldn't encumber yourselves with what I would have it here, not somewhere else in the bylaw, because you have to be fairly specific. Whereas the general nuisance clause is just that the general nuisance clause. Bob, I, I really do think we need something very specific here. Uh, because if we're telling people that your equipment has to meet these standards, they have to meet those standards. Otherwise, it becomes, okay, the guy with the cigarette boats off, they get caught. Mm -hmm. They're still making the noise. But you've got to catch them. And, uh, and I don't want to set us up in a situation where we got to have the windmill noise police running around and, and trying to nail people for making too much noise. It should be uh, in the bylaw, and they should be able to prove that it meets those standards. So we have some sort of a difference of opinion there. Pat? Um, that's also a reason to bring up operational hours. If we want to ensure that our residents can get a good night's sleep. We were looking at that when we looked at the Tavares Stone Yard when people in the neighborhood were complaining that they couldn't sleep. They were awakened way too early in the morning. And we've done this before. We've regulated hours of operation for the benefit of the peace of the neighborhood. And again, there are different ways of, of doing that with sound mitigation here. You can cut it off at night so people can sleep. You can uh, say, okay, it will not go over 40 dBA at night. But you have to be aware that the World Health Organization said you need 30 to get a good night's sleep when we're saying you can't go over 40. And I'm dealing purely with sleep because rest is a necessary um, function of the human body to be able to, to deal with the world, to be healthy. So part of what we have to do as a planning board is to protect the population of this area from um, unwanted types of noise development, uses, whatever. And I think this is one of the more serious parts of this bylaw that we have to deal with. Okay, why don't we, why don't yeah. we, uh, we everyone's thrown on, why don't we, for now, throw out 40 and bring in testimony to see if that number should go up or down, and, and just to move forward. Mm -hmm. Just to yeah. put a placemaker. Yeah, just to place, and so this is, we're not deciding for it, we're laying 40 out there and bring, bring people in. If they, if they disagree with us. 40 is the ambient, or yeah, the total? The total. Okay. And, uh, that's interesting. You read the World Health Organization says above 30 dB is disruptive. To Inside, which means it can't it's be more than about 40 <coughs> outside. Well, okay. To the, uh, but there are other things, centers. obviously, that go into a good night's sleep. It's not just the decibels. It can be the um, amplitude modulation, too, that wakes people up because right. people have different sensitivities. And the vibrations from the infrared. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Um, distance is the solution to most of these problems that we're looking at here. All right. I'd like to move on. Uh, I think we've discussed that um, thoroughly, and we seem to think that uh, we should add something about seasonal variations. 
uh, a minimum ambient level, 40 dBA for total, and hours of operation. Okay, let's, um, let's, I think I have. We're kind of jumping ahead a little bit here, but this is, you were talking some performance standards. I'll plug them in a little further into the bylaw, but not at this paragraph where we stopped. Okay. Okay. All right now, you're looking for some site specific information that's part of the modeling process, for example, topography, and you want a, a seasonal. Um, you want the modeling to take into consideration the seasonality of the uh, of the area. Now we're getting to okay, those now that this this is this is the information package that comes to you, and then now you're you're getting into your procedure for reviews and your performance standards. Now is the time really to start talking about some of the things we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. How are you going to take this information the package that the applicant has popped on your desk? And has made a presentation to you. Now here, here are some procedural questions and then some performance standards. Is the, the, is the next right. page? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm not saying necessarily they belong here. I, I'm saying that okay. those are the so, issues that we brought up right. under this paragraph. We start, uh, and they we, might belong but someplace else. They really belong else. someplace else. Right. right. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, the last, the last uh, item under this sub uh, topic is. Flicker modeling, identification of all properties potentially impacted together with the, mo the methods used for measuring flicker with mitigation circumstances, uh, excuse me, mitigation procedures. So, yeah, Paul? Noise modeling is a pretty sophisticated process, but it's pretty well developed and defined. Uh, is there a similar approach on flicker modeling? Where there's an agreed standard on what modeling is to be done, it seems to me yeah. it's awful site specific. It's very. I how you come up with a standard yeah. modeling procedure for yeah. such a site specific condition. I, I, I'm no expert in it, but those I've talked to say yes, it can be done. It's a lot of geometry and uh, angles of the sun and the height of the uh, turbine. Uh, but once you know those uh, certain parameters, you can. Uh, you can do a uh, pretty quick model based on the height of the, you know, from July to, you know, from June 20th to, you know, December 20th, you can figure out just exactly where this shadow is going to fall and when. <coughs> and uh, that's why we want all those adjacent parcels uh, to find out just where, where these shadows fall and when. And if they're there, what are you going to do about it? And then up to them to demonstrate to you. Uh, that there's no flicker, or if there is, then we'll take care of it. Is the period of time that flicker is becomes a problem? Yeah. And I've yeah. been near turbines, and maybe it was 10 minutes. Um, is that adequate? Is that appropriate? I've driven up 28 in the winter time, and the flicker was pretty, pretty annoying just driving up the highway. Um, so it's pretty site specific, and there is a timing element in there too. That correct. I'm not sure how you. Don't, you do the modeling. Yeah, don't, you, the modeling for you don't have to worry about that. You are telling these folks that uh, you want them to identify these impacted areas, the methods for measuring it, show us how you did it, and if there are issues, how you're going to take care of them. If there are no issues, uh, you have the ability to have a third party look at this information. But again, you want you wanted to tell them what you want. You don't want to tell them how to do it. Let them come in and say, here's how we did it. And, and none of us here are expert enough to know, uh, and we don't want to become experts. We will hire an expert that says, okay, fine. Or, yeah, you need some additional information. You just want them to come in with this uh, Flickr analysis, Flickr modeling, whatever it might be, uh, and demonstrate to the satisfaction of this board that it's been done correctly, and that if there are issues, they have been mitigated. Or if there are no issues, um, <coughs> you can make it a condition, certain conditions of approval, or you know, uh, a third-party peer review uh, might be in order. If they say oh, everything's fine, then you can send it out to your expert. I agree. You don't have to tell them how to do it, but you have to set the criteria that you want them to to model. Uh, I wouldn't even do that. Uh, just like the noise modeling, you may, may set some broad parameters. Uh, let them come in to show you their information. When you start getting really specific, 
then they'll come in with exactly that. And they'll say, that's exactly what you asked me for. Uh, so you need to, <coughs> so I realize it's a little bit of a balancing act, but you have to be careful with sometimes exactly like what you ask for. So let, let it be relatively generic. Uh, not wholly specific as to, you know, we want you to use, we want you to use technical release 55 from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to, to, to determine your runoff from your site. And we did that for years. And technical release 55 in your regulations would then became technical release 62 and 62A and 65A. We should have just said, show us your calculations to determine the, the, the rate of runoff from your facility you want to use technical release 55 or the rational method or whatever it is, our professional engineer will review it and determine whether or not it's on. We'll let them determine what they're going to use. Yeah, Doug. So then are you saying that they'll come in and say our turbine will produce flicker on house at 28 whatever way for 30 minutes at a time or whatever it'll be and then we'll decide if that's acceptable? You have a performance standard later on in your bylaw that will determine whether that's acceptable. If it's not acceptable, then you're going to have to turn your turbine off during those time frames. But let me, I think it's in there somewhere. Yeah, it, it says is. no more than 30 minutes per day and not to exceed 10 hours per day at the property line. Is it? It's there. Yeah. yeah. So we're it's under safety and environmental standards. Right. Okay. So. All right, so I'm going on to the next, um, the next paragraph which is entitled Procedure for Review. In addition to the requirements found in paragraph 301, uh, 1 through 8, which is, those are the requirements for gen generically speaking uh, special permits. Applications for a special permit under this article shall be subject to the following procedural requirements. Applications for small wind energy systems shall be subject to these requirements at the discretion of the special granting authority. We defined small uh, wind energy systems as less than 60. 300 watts, was it? 60. Less than 60. What was it? 60 kilowatts. 60 kilowatts. kilowatts. Oh, I see it. Okay, right. 60 kilowatts. Or it's 0.3. Between, between 0.3 and 60 kilowatts. Okay. All right. Now, before you get uh, into the first, first bullet point, Ralph. Uh, I'm sorry? Before you get into this first bullet point with regards to uh, parties and interest and uh, notifying people in the outreach area, we've kind of been giving that some thought and talk here that right now we're we're saying that we want you the, the public outreach area is four times the is the system height which is four times the uh, uh, height. I'm sorry, tip. it's the tip, tip, tip of the blade plus ten percent I think it is. We're thinking that that might really to use that measure with regards to the public outreach area might be uh, problematic because of the the way things work with the assessor's office and whatnot, we're thinking now to, to advise the board to simply use a standard number, where that number is. Right now it's 300 feet for your uh, parties of interest. So we're thinking uh, you may want to use 1,000 feet you know, or use a specific number, whatever it might be. Uh, and if someone comes in with a very small system, you can waive that down to what you might think is more appropriate. Uh, you may just say the 300 feet by the 60 kilowatt. So I, I asked the board to, to think about that uh, again. Right now, uh, we were going to use a rate, you know, the bigger the, the, bigger the, the wind energy system, the bigger the outreach area. But we're finding that there are some practical difficulties in doing that just in administration of the bylaw and the generation of the butters lists. So right now I think in the, we're thinking maybe a thousand feet and we can wave it down to, to the small thousand feet? We're thinking a thousand feet as a number for, for everybody. The three hundred feet is your parties of interest, that's the that's the state law. 
And then the public outreach area would be 300 feet to 1,000 feet. If you come up with a very small system, you can wave that back down all the way back to the 300 feet. You can't go below 300 feet. You could have a... But this would be substantially less than three times the height on a larger tower, though. Well, right now we're saying 1,000. You may even say 1,500. I was just... Right. right. We we're throwing a number out there for practical for practicalities for one number. For one number. Right, right now we're thinking a standard a standard number from 300 to 1,200 feet or 1,500 feet, whatever the board is comfortable with, and then you can wave that down to 300 feet based on the size of the tool. So you're asking us to think of <coughs> reconsider the definition of public outreach area, which is something that we right. Consider earlier. So consider everybody think earlier. about that, okay? Right. And it's just one of those <laughs> just one of those issues that it might make a lot of sense to have a number. Okay. Just like the board waves subdivision rules and regulations. You have to have a <coughs> three hundred foot center line offset. Whether you have a two lot subdivision or a two hundred lot subdivision, you need a three hundred foot center line offset. But you wave that down based on the size of the subdivision. And that's the thinking here again. So just revisit, we'll think about that, we'll revisit that. Think of a number that the board is coming to. All right. Okay. All right, so then now we will go ahead to the first bullet, <clears throat> which is, as stated, with the exception of those property owners identified as parties of interest, and that's how your, is that, that defined? That's your 300 foot. Okay. That's not under our definitions, is it? You don't have to. It's in the state law. I'm sorry? You don't have to. It's in the state law. I know, but for general... And it's in the... It's in your special permit section of your... Yeah, okay, right. Local okay. zoning right. law. Right. Party of interest. Okay. The special <clears throat> permit granting authority shall, by regular mail, alert property owners within the public outreach area of the time, place, and date of the required public hearing for the wind energy system. The purpose of this outreach effort is to broaden the base of information gathering beyond that typically required of other special permit applications, while not conferring party in interest status beyond that defined by the special general law. Section 11, chapter 48, general law. Right. Okay, that's comments on that paragraph? That's a good, good add-on that addresses Rich's concern. Right. Say again? Oh, I said that's a good add-on at the end there, that they're not conferring party of an interest status beyond as defined by the State law. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> I believe that happened while I was gone. Okay. The next, the next paragraph. Hearing no comments on that. Criteria for review. Applications shall be subject to these performance requirements, except that applications for small wind energy systems shall be at the discretion of the special permitting granting authority. Here we get specific, so we'll take them one at a time. Height, to be determined by the special permitting granting authority based on industry standards and is the minimum necessary for adequate operation of the wind energy system. So that's pretty generic and, and uh, leaving it open to industry standards. I have I have an issue with industry standards because I don't know if there are any and it seems like um, the different the different manufacturers might have different standards. I, I, I don't know if there's if there are industry standards. Okay. Well it would be for that particular wind energy system. Well they uh if I could, they have standards such as uh, you wouldn't want to recommend one that's not at least 50 feet above the tree line. Mm -hmm. They have standards like that so that they know the thing is going to function well. 
Are they all are they consistent? Are all the manufacturers consistent with that? I don't know about that, but I know that. Well, that's, that's what an example example industry of, means. So just saying that's an example of industry standard of you know like for the things to perform, they have their standards that they require for a site. I, I'm just saying that industry standards. I'm, my guess is that they vary quite a bit, but I don't I know. I guess so too. I would, you know, so when you say when you say to be determined and based upon industry standards. What are we doing? We're juggling a bunch of, of balls here. Um, I, I just, I, I'm not just all that comfortable with, with, I, with, the, word, with, the, with the words industry standards. We'll go back and tighten it up a little bit then. I've got it noted. Okay, so just going to put a little question mark there. Okay. Other fine. comments about industry standards, Paul? Well, the following phrase I have a concern. Minimum necessary for adequate operation. I determines power generated exponentially. So the higher it is, the more power you get. So by saying minimum necessary for adequate operation doesn't really decide anything because it depends on what you're going to produce. You said the high. So I'm not sure the terminology makes a lot of sense in that case. And we need to just change the phraseology a bit. In other words, if in fact I have a 60 kilowatt turbine, uh, and the height has to be y, according to some variation of uh, acceptable industry standard or yeah. comparable example. I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, it's the it's the word minimum that's the issue here. Or? Or, you, well, or what is necessary I'm for the adequate what operation? Adequate, what adequate means in that case? Right, so to adequate, okay. In other words, to reach I mean, it could be. the, the, the uh, <coughs> nameplate capacity or something. But adequate is, is uncomfortable. Okay. Necessary to achieve the performance of the unit. Okay. Yeah. Is what you're really talking about. The maximum My performance. Adequate operation. Oh, that's a, such a nebulous phrase. That then we will go back and look at that. Okay, Doug. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the wording either. The height is to be determined by the special permit granting authority? I don't think that makes sense. They're going to determine the height that's re required for their unit to function, and then they're going to bring it to us, and we're going to say, okay. I'm sorry, but that's too tall for this neighborhood, or right. something like that. I see. Right. Remember, back to purpose. Yeah, yeah Bob? Well, I think the height uh, should be based on the manufacturer's uh, specifications for the maximum output of the unit that they're installing. And then the setbacks are going to determine if that's going that height is going to be curtailed or, or extended. Either. So uh, we do have a fail-safe there, I believe, with, with that next uh, item. Setback. Yeah, because if the manufacturer says this needs to be 70 feet tall, but the setback requirement uh, isn't met by that 70 foot tower, then that's just that work. negates it. Yeah, it's not going to work. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to take another look at the definition. Uh, so I'll go back and instead of industry standard and manufacturer standards, you would like some different examples, and adequate operation is uncomfortable. We'll go back to some sort of rated capacity, performance into yeah. rated capacity. Okay. But at all times, we won't be conceding 240-1, which is the purpose of our zoning bylaw, that first paragraph. Always go back to okay, We always yeah. go back to Always go home. Yeah, we never concede that for, in order to perform at some standard, this is the only way we could do it, and then we basically just throw away. Which is why we took a long time right. yeah. up front. Right. This is what we're doing. So we're always going to come back to that at every time. Yeah. So I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next, next sub uh, paragraph is setbacks. Safety setback. Now this is for safety only now. From the property lines shall be no less than, than the system height plus 10%. Comments. That. I'd like to know how we're defining safety. We could be defining it as collapse, fall down of the tower, 
We could be defining it as ice throw. Um, we could be defining it as the type of flicker that Paul had experienced on 28 and so did I, which has um, greatly disturbed motorists. If you're suddenly there where you've got this horrendous um, black flicker. Um, so I think we need to say, first of all, what are we looking at for safety? And then does the height plus 10% really accomplish what we need for safety? Well, to that's, to that's me, safety is, safety is potentially injurious to a person's health, you know, and, that, and whether it's physical health or mental health or whatever it is, but I mean, it's safety is dealing with a person's... Yeah. We can be a little more specific, you know, or yeah. it's for ice throw, blade throw, these things typically don't fall down, uh, right. but it's those types of uh, calamity issues, and not so much flicker issues. Ten percent of the total height of the tower may not be sufficient. I have not read, I can't quote anything here right now, but I don't know how far ice throw may occur. I don't know. We've had a couple of instances here on the island of uh, Parker's boat here, I think it was. Um, of blade throw. I don't know how far those blades went. All right, we have we have that information. We'll make sure the board's aware. Okay. Other comments about that safety? I had penciled in um, ice throw per manufacturer specs. That's that's what I had put in there. Um, but I would add ice and blade throw per ma uh, manufacturer specs specification. This, the size plus 10% seems to me like just a fall zone. That's what I'm thinking too. Yeah. No. That's why I needed to have safety defined. What are right. we right. really looking at here for safety issues? Okay, the next, uh, the next uh, sub item there is noise setback. Shall be determined by the special permit and granting authority from noise model results and must not exceed 10 decibels over ambient sound levels at the property line. Comments on that? Did everybody get that in order to maintain being crossed out? And in substituted in there was and must not exceed? I didn't get that. Okay. So cross out in order to maintain and add and must not exceed. Comments and questions? <clears throat> I had penciled in here infrasound and parentheses nuisance. Um, and I don't know what setbacks are um, right now we're, found about infrasound. Yeah, right now we're dealing with sound we can hear. I'm sorry? Right now we're dealing with sound we can hear. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, okay. So let's just start there. We'll get into those other issues later. But, okay, well, we need to deal with infrasound somewhere. Okay, mm -hmm. Pat? Yeah, if we're putting in um, can't exceed uh, 40 dBA just to gather comments on it. This is potentially an opposition of, so we, we're going to have two parts of this draft that aren't the same necessarily. If we say it can't exceed um, 10 dBA over ambient sound, but we're saying it can't exceed 40 dBA, right. they're not the same. And I don't know what we want to do. Just leave it this way and say, look, we're doing this for purposes of discussion. If, if it can't be over 40 dBA, don't even have a bylaw. Just don't have it. Is my recommendation. Because you're doing a boring thing. You know, they've got this yeah. thing. You, you think 40 dBA is sometimes ambient. Mm -hmm. So it, I think you need to think about that. That's well, that's why when Jim said, let's just put it well, in what is the number? marker. What is it? I, mean, I just picked 40 dBA because it's been thrown around. Yeah, I think is I think right 80? now, if you want to, let's, let's, let's go out with this state standard. 
for what you can hear. Uh, get some comments on that and, and go from there. There are others who say, you know, it'd be hard for us to do the World Health thing, 30 dBA, in the building. Well, we can't go in someone's house and measure that. But we're uh, staying at the property line. Right? So we say, okay, if you maintain 10, the state standard at the property line, uh, you're probably going to be okay inside the house. I think that's what we're talking about, right, mm -hmm. at the property line. Right, yeah. Yeah. at yeah. the property line. So not, I might have a house that's uh, 1,200 feet or from the property line or 120 feet from the property line. We're saying maintain it not at the house, not at the, your property. We're saying you maintain it at your property. Line. Yes. Right. Because I, I brought this up when we first started talking about it because you may own land next to one of these things and you have a right to build a house within 20, 20 foot setback anywhere on your on your property and you don't want a, a, a user to come up and usurp the right of your property because they're already there. And so that's why I said it should be at the property line so that the abutters property values are protected. That's why it's there. Is it the wind turbine the owner's property, property line. line? That's where the measurement right. should take place. Right. Because if they're if they're not bothering anybody, if they put their nose noise on their own land, right. if it goes onto a neighbor's land, that's a nuisance. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so when you get to, uh, the only comment there was mine and infrasound belongs somewhere else. All right. We'll have to have a discussion on noise we can't hear, and there aren't a lot of standards out there. We're still working on that a little bit. All right. The we next took the, took the easy thing, we noise we can hear. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're, we're not to be flip, or yeah, we're still looking into that. Okay. Good. The next, the next sub uh, item here is called is uh, called clearing to be determined. That's clearing vegetation, I guess, um, and maybe even a hill or something. I don't know to be determined by the special permitting granting authority based on site plan information. Temporary construction staging areas shall be revegetated. Comments on that paragraph. Okay, I, this is where I had penciled in modeling for terrain uh, desirable. Um, Paul brought up I think earlier modeling for terrain and this is where I put it in and I don't know if that's where it belongs but it seemed to me that it was possibly could go there so I don't know what anybody thinks about that but I'll find the right box I okay. understand the board looking for size specificity and I'll find the right spot for it okay the next <clears throat> The next uh, sub paragraph uh, item is called design standards. Here's re here we're getting in rather rather specific. Color and finish <laughs> shall be white or gray and non-reflective. Lighting: the wind energy systems may, system may not externally be externally illuminated except as may be required for emergency navigation. That was mostly for air, air navigation or security purposes. Signs, other than for emergency information purposes, are prohibited. A signs, the, the word A and signs there at the end of that sentence is to be crossed out. Uh, the next line, utility connections shall be underground. We'll delete the word duh. <laughs> What's the DH? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll right. take credit for that. <laughs> and, 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 that, and, and now we have other. Now, are there any comments or, quest, or questions uh, about that particular uh, area of the bylaw called design standards? Anybody have any, anything that they want to add there or anything? Okay, I found, I found one, um, one um, example in another bylaw that I looked at, and on the on the on the uh, 
a line that says signs. I put in um, other than for informa for emergency information, and I said or education, and what what what's referred to there is people who would walk up to these units. Uh, if they could get close enough, or even at, at a sign on the fence, might educate them as to who owns the who owns the uh, the unit, what it produces, uh, what you know that kind of thing. So, you, you you could have you might want to include a sign that has something to do with education about the unit that is there, and then the other one that I found was that no advertising would be allowed. And when you say, well, no, signs, signs are prohibited, there are other ways to advertise. Um, you could have a flag up there, or you could have a, um, a, a, um, an, a loudspeaker uh, advertising something that, that, that would be there. So it was sort of a catch-all. I just noted that uh, that was in another bylaw that uh, no advertising was allowed. So those are things we might want to consider. Nobody else had anything, I don't believe. Jim? Well, just they should comply with all the other sign laws in the Design Review Committee on signage that we already have. Well, we, they, should, you know, they should stay within those standards. I'm sure that... Number of signs, the size, that's all spelled out. Yeah, number of signs and size. But it doesn't say... What, what it's about. Well, if they choose to have an educational sign, it has to be the, the right that. size. I understand. That. Right. But this said no no signs other than for emergency. Well, I guess they could have a so I, I, I've said standard could, business sign that everybody else gets. Right. Whatever. Well, that, that's why I that's I why I put it in there. Okay. We move on to the next, next subset here. Safety and environmental standards. Emergency services to be coordinated with the Falmouth Fire and Rescue and approved by the Special Permitting Granting Authority. Unauthorized access. Turban area should be fenced to preclude unauthorized access. Shadow flicker. Demonstrate no more than 30 minutes per day, not to exceed 10 hours per year at the property line. Comments or questions? <clears throat> Hearing none, I had, I had two that I pulled up from pulled out from other uh, examples uh, that I reviewed. Um, no hazmat is allowed on the site, and also no electromagnetic interference to be generated. So you so the the wind turbine couldn't be interfering with um, radio or television or uh, other uh, uh, internet type of interference. So I had I suggested that those two be added, and and uh, they're just suggestions. Pat. Okay, this is something I don't know about, but I have read because one of the complaints is that certain oils and so forth have to be kept on the site, and I don't know whether those are in sufficient quantity to be considered as hazardous. Well, I don't think they have to be kept on the site, but they might be involved in the, you know, as in lubricating the machinery at the time, but the hazardous, if it's considered hazardous material, it could be stored somewhere else, and when they service the unit, they bring it. It could. Yes. I, think, I think from what I've read, the concern is that it is generally stored there. Don't ask me why, but I'm just bringing that up. Um, and I like the idea of no hazardous materials stored. They probably use a lot of uh, hydraulic fluid or mm -hmm. lubricant. Or yeah. Probably is a need for a lot of it, so they probably do prefer to store it on mm -hmm. site. Well, there's a certain amount of danger also of spillage if you constantly have to transport it. I know nothing about mm -hmm. how often that has to be change, use, whatever. Anybody else have some comments on hazardous material? I really don't think it would be that big of an issue. I mean, think about all the hazardous materials people have in the garages. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I, 
I thought no excess hazardous materials. <laughs> well, well, I might be able to leave up to the fire department to. Yeah. Because there there are ways of storing it right. that is not proper, going to get right. out. There's proper containers and ways in the fire department has rules for all that. So we should yeah. So that. maybe that, that should be mentioned in here positively. Probably that. should have stuff materials within the should be storage stored. area in the base of it or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, hazardous materials stored shall be properly uh, stored and contained. With according to, according to oh, the federal oh, fire department. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So then you don't say no. You just say hazardous material. Yeah. On site stored properly. Okay. Any other comments on safety and environmental standards? <clears throat> oh, Brian? No, we'll put some uh, language similar to the uh, coordinate your emergency services, including hazmat response with the Found Fire and Rescue Department. Okay. Okay. Uh, Any? The rest of the, the I'm sorry. That's my only comment here. Okay. The rest of the bylaw, page five, really is. Uh, we're redoing that in much more detail for your next meeting. So if you want to stop here, I think it would be appropriate. Okay. Pages right. three and four, we're, we're going okay. two at a time, it looks like. Okay. So we'll work on this some more, and you'll get pages five and six <clears throat> uh, probably sometime early next week for discussion. Along with all the changes and additions you want here. Okay. So we'll discuss. Any them. any comments or suggestions for Brian and the, and the rest of the staff when they when they consider the rest of the things? I I have Pat. Yep. It's something that I have seen in several of the bylaws is that they require a property value warranty to be um, given to the potential properties being affected. I. I sort of feel uncomfortable about it, but I'm bringing it up because it is in a number of the bylaws. And one of the things that we have heard complaints about is the decreased valuation of property. Right. And so I'm bringing that up. I don't know whether we want to put it in here. One that addresses that. <laughs> I don't think that would survive. Uh, I, I think 241 yeah. talks to that point. It talks about preserving property values. I mean, that's a pretty strong paragraph. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, you know, I think you would do it with your decision. In other words, right. you wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I don't think the AG would approve of. Okay. I you think can try. You can try, but you know, if we you probably take it up. Do this right. She would do it. Won't impact property value. Right. Well, that's the hope. Right. That's. It's um, just that a review, I think, when we're looking at this, if we're doing a review of potential of the bylaws, as Brian said, we don't want to remake the wheel if we're right. looking at things. And we right. say, yeah, we like it, or nah, we don't want it. And so I brought that up because it is in several of them, and uh, such warranties can be extensive. Mm -hmm. We also want to get it approved by town meeting and the AG. Right. I'm I not had, suggesting I like the idea. I had the suggestion, Brian, that I didn't see included in the in the rest of the, and that was something to do with decommissioning. I didn't see. Oh, we're working on it. Okay. okay. All right. Good. Uh, that comes out of their financial Sure. Nice job, uh, Brian, with this and uh, planning board. Some good good input here for uh, moving the process forward. The next item on the agenda are committee reports. I asked, um, you, you may know that I'm on the Charter Review Committee, which has no direct, I mean, I wasn't appointed by this board to be on the Charter Review Committee, but there is a section in the Charter that deals with the Planning Board. And uh, you may not be familiar with it, but uh, you probably should be. And. Um, I, I, I'm going to give you what my um, my input to the Charter Review Committee is concerning the Planning Board uh, section, and I would uh, entertain comments from you and also suggestions. Um, there's one part of the um, of the Charter that deals with um, a master plan. And uh, what, what that is, is, is considered to be our local comprehensive plan. So I, add, I ask 
the Charter Review Committee, well, under definitions of the Charter, we will be adding a definition that says the master plan is equal to the local comprehensive plan, rather than changing the wording in the Charter itself. I think that, that makes sense. And, it, and also, because we have become the local comprehensive planning committee and that there is no the planning board is now that that committee it was necessary to remove a paragraph that says um, these inclusion uh, changes or portions developed by the by other committees must receive the uh, vote and approval by the planning board. So that's no longer necessary because we are the planning committee. So that's just a deletion. Then there's a section in the, in the, in the charter that deals with <clears throat> um, specifically um, some, some things that are pertinent to other organizations that are elected in town. And, and also that are, that are appointed, appointed boards. And it, it, it reads as such. Organize annually, elect necessary officers, establish a quorum, adopt rules and procedures and voting, maintain minutes and attendance and copies of which will be given to the town clerk. Well, I objected to the charter singling out the planning board to do that because it's required by all of the, not only appointed boards, but elected boards. So I've asked the Charter Review Committee if we could drop that from the portion that's, that, that's in, it's in the planning board section and add it to a section that would apply to all of the planning boards, all the elected boards, and the and the appointed boards, and so we're we are working on that on that language, and it will be dro probably dropped from the planning board section, but incorporated in another section of the charter that deals with more than just the planning board. Okay, so it's it's sort of a um, it's a, it's a change, but it, it doesn't change the way we're going to operate. It's just not singling us out as being the only ones required to do that. And uh, that's basically what I wanted to bring to your attention um, as far as what's going on with the, and I think I, I would ask if you have any comments about that and also you may want to look it up on, on, on the internet. The charter is on the internet and, and, and take a look at uh, section C46, which is entitled Planning Board. And it's, you're probably familiar with 95% of it just because, even if you haven't read it specifically, because that's the way we operate. So, does anyone have any questions or, or, or if you want, if you have some, you could give them to me um, at the next meeting. Yes, Bob? Uh, no question on that. But, oh, uh, okay. Uh, do you, oh, and then you want uh, committee reports or a charter review. Do you have another committee report? I, I have a, not necessarily a specific committee, but uh, an item that has come up in uh, the two committees that I sit on, and I'm not sure whether this is the time to bring it up or whether it should come up under new business. Well, we don't have new business. Would be something at the next, uh, next at another meeting, right. the next right. subsequent meeting. Right. It's not listed here under committee reports, um, but that's not to say that I think we couldn't entertain more than one committee report. We did list a spe one right. specific right. report, so I don't have any problem with. You, you go ahead. Uh, well, one of the things that keeps coming up is uh, transportation and public transportation and the lack of a transformation the transportation committee now. And I think maybe we need to get that ball rolling again and, and uh, do something because it does, I mean, Pat and Jim, it comes up uh, all the time. All the time. Oh, yeah. All the time. And uh, we don't seem to be doing anything about it. And it seems to be a vital 
piece to the puzzle of keeping this town viable and uh, keeping the tourists uh, coming. In. So there's a, a lot to it, and it's a shame that that committee is uh, dissolved, I believe. Well, there's still one or two members, but they, they don't they, have a they quorum. They don't have a so quorum, so. It, it, is an appointed, it is an appointed committee by the select. So really, um, what we could do is we, what we could do as a planning board is to send a memo to the selectmen saying that we feel it's vital to, that, that, that it be reinstituted and and and, and, uh, and you know they that they solicit people if you want to as a subcommittee do you want to do that or do you want me to, to want, ask the staff to draft the up the letter and I'll sign it or what do you want to do? Whatever the procedure sounds easy. Yeah. I'm sorry? That sounds easy. It's easy if um, how do you how do you all feel about that? Let's have the staff draw, drop a letter and you sign it. That one sounds good. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's what we're, we're gonna next week for you to take a look at. <laughs> okay, that'd be great. Okay. I, so I'm that's good. Oh I'm, wait a minute, I'm wait a minute, wait wait one second. Well, Bob had more. Bob had more than one item he wanted to bring. No, no, that was it. That was it. Oh, I thought you said you had more than one. Okay, Pat. Okay, the the thing I would like to bring up here is that under the charter, the various committees that are supposed to have that do have something to do with planning and transportation is definitely part of planning for the town. Are supposed to at least yearly. Um, report to the planning board as to what they're doing and what their hopes and dreams are for their committee so that we can give feedback on it. Uh, it's still just the, doesn't that's happen. Still in the committee. I, I know mean, it that's is. still in the chart. I know it is, but it just doesn't happen. And so my question here is, particularly since transportation has so much to do with what we are as a town and our planning efforts, is this something that the board might want to take on under a subcommittee, much like the local comprehensive plan? It's our responsibility. Throwing it out, and the selectmen would have to say, yeah, fine. You know, we'll We would become the transportation we become, committee? We would have a oh, subcommittee sub of, of, say, three of Some our, of our board members and others. And we could appoint other people who have expertise in it from the town. Or invite the okay, um, existing members of the committee. Precisely yeah, right. to join. All right, let's. Why, why don't we? Why don't we? Why don't we think about that yeah, and and and, uh, and bring it up at the, at our next meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay. But that would that would be a major That would be a big change for us, and we'd have to be willing to. We'd have to have members yeah. on this committee willing to serve on that subcommittee. So you so before you say yes, consider whether or not you're willing to mm -hmm. serve. No, Jim. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> in a future meeting, I would like to bring up a review or at least a discussion of 24026C of the bylaws. It and is, that is it's a part of the general residential zoning that allows for affordable housing. Okay. All right, so we can put that on the agenda. When it fits. Is that real short? No, it isn't. I just don't want to discuss it anymore because okay. I'm not allowed to. I just right, want to I understand. Okay, right. Okay. Any other uh, items that people want on the on the future agenda? Sounds like we've got a couple. I think I had a couple too, but I can't remember what they were. <laughs> I'll think of them. Anyway, uh, okay. Correspondence. I do have some correspondence which I do want to read. I hope you will bear with me. Um, and um, because it it has to do with our two of them have to do with our developing of uh, our our wind turbine bylaw. I'm going to start with those, and then I'll finish with something else. The first <clears throat> the first letter. Is from the Woods Hole Research Center, and as you know, they have a um, wind turbine. And uh, this is from Dr. Eric Davidson, who is the president and director of the Woods Hole Research Center. Dear Chairman, her, uh, dated June, June 28th, of 2010. 
Whoa, I wonder, that must be a typo on their part. Because we received it June, July 2nd of 2012. Mail slow. <laughs> I'm going to assume that there was a typo on their part. Uh, uh, it has to be. be a bold assumption. It has to be. Uh, here's the letter. I'm going to circle that and then just put a question mark. Um, here's the letter. Dear Chairman Herbst, thank you for the opportunity to comment. As owners of a 100 kilowatt wind turbine on our campus at Woods Hole since the fall of 2009, we have been following the controversies around Falmouth's 1600 kilowatt municipal turbines, as well as the notice 1600 kilowatt turbine. That's the one at, at um, Tech Park, I believe. Okay. Please note that, the, <clears throat> that those large turbines are three or four times taller and produce 16 times more electric, electricity than the wind turbine on our campus. Our <clears throat> 100 kilowatt wind turbine provides us with significant portion of energy needs for our campus and does it cleanly and with a minimum of noise. In combination with our large array of photovoltaic panels, we avoid emitting any pollution to the neighborhood from the two buildings on our campus. Our main office building is located only 150 feet from the base of the turbine, yet no member of our staff of 55 has complained about noise or vibration, or has any staff member complained of or suffered any ill effects from our wind turbine. In fact, staffers often eat their lunch or meet at picnic tables for, informational meet for informal meetings at the base of the turbine. Any issues with occasional shadow flicker have been addressed with window shades. We have been open in dealing with the neighbors about our concerns. We have adjusted our turbine to avoid flicker on our one neighbor's home during specific periods of the year. We have invited other neighbors to provide specific flicker details so that we can attempt to mitigate. We have invested in programming that allows the wind turbine to reduce speed or shut down at certain times because neighbors believe that winds from a certain direction at high speeds increase the sound from their vantage point. To our knowledge, the only complaint this year, 2012, has been from a resident of Ransom Road whose home is 900 feet away and on the opposite side of Busy Woods Hole Road. This person has complained about the vibrations saying that they emanate from our turbine. The complaint was re restated at the recent Public Board of Health hearing on May 24th. If invited, we are willing to visit the home when the vibrations are being felt to allow us to witness any disturbance. However, we are very strongly doubt that we are the source of the vibrations this person feels. Cape Cod is blessed with among the best wind resources in New England, which can, of course, be a major future source of clean energy at modest cost. We are thus helping to determine the renewable energy options for the future. Wind turbines help lessen air pollution, reduce our dependence on foreign fossil fuels, and are central to sustainable energy independence on Cape Cod and elsewhere. Sincerely, Dr. Eric A. Davidson. The second letter is from Mr. Day O. Mount. O. Mr. Day o Mount. It was received, it was, it was dated July 3rd of 2012 and received July, received July 5th. Dear Chairman and Madam Vice Chairman, thank you for, and your board for your efforts to draft the new bylaws to regulate wind turbines in Falmouth. Those of us who have been affected by the industrial turbines have learned enough to know that industrial sized turbines are not the only size that can cause problems. Your new rules will be crucial to successful use. I recently learned that the Treetops Condominium Association and the Woods Hole Research Center, which we just heard, uh, uh, read a letter from, have a memorandum of understanding in place to deal with the noise problems from, a, from the relatively small wind, Woods Hole Research Center turbine. It is a positive step when turbines, excuse me, it is a positive step when problems can be worked out between neighbors. However, as you have heard in your testimony, at least one other Woods Hole Research neighbor has had problems that have not been able to be worked out. <clears throat> when direct dialogue doesn't work, what does the town offer to do? Question mark. Is the word Woods Hole Research Center turbine in violation of state or town noise guidelines? 
Question mark. If the neighbor's dog barks, the police will come. In the case of wind turbines, the answer so far has been, those affected can complain, but the town itself will do no testing. Turbine noise testing is complex, time consuming, and if contractors are involved, expensive. Ultimately, the DEP had to assume responsibility for testing WIN 1 and WIN 2, taking over two years. As the board works on the bylaws to permit new turbines, please consider that a complaint and testing system needs to be established at the same time. One approach would be that any turbine should be tested for compliance after installation. Compliance must be defined by the permit, and the permit should stipulate the consequences of non-compliance, up to and including removal if permit conditions cannot be met. A complaint testing capability would, be, would still be needed if subsequent operations prove to be a problem. Sincerely, Day Mount. Two letters to be considered. The last letter of correspondence is from the town manager dated July 2nd, 2012, received July 6th, to Chairman Herbst. Subject, land use vision map. Dear Ralph, I am writing on behalf of the Board of Selectmen. At the Board's regular meeting on June 4th, the four members of the Board President voted unanimously, unanimously as follows, quote, to send a letter to the Planning Board requesting that they take action on a land use vision map for the Town of Falmouth and that the Board of Selectmen would help them in any way that it can." Unquote. As you may know, the Board in recent months has been discussing <clears throat> the absence of a land use vision map for the Town of Falmouth and the ramifications of this in working with the Cape Cod Commission. Most recently, this issue arose regarding the current proposal from Teledyne to significantly expand their corporate facilities within the town. Thank you for your assistance of the Planning Board in moving this forward expeditiously. Please advise if I, Heather Harper, or town staff members can be of support in working with Brian Curry and the Planning Board in furtherance of this. Sincerely, Julian Suso. I copied the Board of Selectmen, Heather Harper, and Brian. So, just to review, as I recall, we had discussed this, and Brian, please help me if, I'm, if I misspeak, but I believe that we took a look at this proposal about a year ago from the Cape Cod Commission, and we had decided, more or less, basically, that what we had in place currently, our zoning bylaws, were um, dealt sufficiently with the land use here in Falmouth. Am I reasonably correct in that statement? It was a it was a few years ago. It was a f more than more, a, more, more than, than a year. year. Okay. And uh, at that time, it was uh, relayed to the board that this was a voluntary effort, and there were no regulatory implications. Uh, I guess in two thousand and nine, that all changed, and now there are certain regulatory implications with regards to the regional policy plan. Um, so I guess the question would be to revisit that now that there is a, a link to this map, supposedly to actions that will be taken by the Cape Cod Commission, but developments of regional impact. Um, so let me, uh, <coughs> let me just advise the board I have no sense of urgency. You have no sense of urgency? I have no sense of urgency. Okay. However, I think uh, we'll take some time and revisit the question. I'll discuss it with the commission staff and its executive director. They're all very nice people. Um, find out exactly how many other towns have taken advantage of the threshold changes. That's a wholly different application process attached to this map. Uh, my understanding is that no town has taken advantage of it because the application process is fairly onerous. So if I can find a relatively easy way and time effective way to do this, uh, I will. But I have, I have no sense of urgency to convey to the board that the town needs this soon. 
Okay. Well, <clears throat> there's a difference of opinion there because the Board of Selectmen feel that there is some urgency because they asked us to move it forward expeditiously. I would be willing to, I think an immediate response to this letter is required, of which I am willing to sign and forward to the Board of Selectmen. And um, I, I would like us to, at this time, uh, come forth with an idea or two for, to draft this letter and what it should say. Um, it seems as though I am not aware of an issue regarding Teledyne's expansion of their corporate facilities. We had voted to, this is up on, um, what, help me with the street. Uh, on Edgerton Drive. Edgerton Drive. And Paul, I believe this happened before your time here, um, but up, up at the top of Edgerton Drive, there was a large piece of property on the left-hand side that was under control of the um, economic EDIC, Economic Development and Information Investment. Investment. Okay, Corporation, and they they chose to sell that property, which was, I believe, the last piece of property under their under their jurisdiction at the time, to Teledyne because Teledyne, I believe, bought Benthos. Mm -hmm. which is across the street, and then Teledyne wanted to expand their operation, and everybody thought, once we looked at it, it was going to generate jobs in the town, considerable number of jobs, um, probably some ta a considerable amount of tax revenues, because it would be an improved piece of property, a large improved piece of property. And so the planning board agreed that it was... Uh, a wise thing to do, and and it happened. Now, I don't know what they're referring to here as um, a, 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 because most re it says because most recently this issue arose regarding the current proposal from Teledyne to significantly expand their corporate facilities with the town. Do you, do you happen to know anything about that, Brian? Yeah, let me let me just gather the information for the board. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, Teledyne is moving forward in their hardship exemption process with the Cape Cod Commission. There could have been, um, let, me, let me gather some information for the board, not speak off of the cuff here. If there's a sense of urgency on behalf of the board of selectmen, let me find out exactly what that is and come back and report to the board. Okay, do you think that uh, a, a, a letter signed by me st stating the, what you're going to do um, I, I, on, on our behalf would be appropriate? I, I think a response eventually is appropriate. Um, again, that vote was taken. <clears throat> this vote was taken um, June 4th. And we received the letter July 6th. A month I, later. I, then I think the board has the same time frame to fashion a response. So in other words, you're saying that the sense of urgency, since it took them a month to get us the letter, is really not that urgent. I, I'm just saying that yeah. I think the board is with its rights it. to I'll take, take that I'll amount of time it. to formulate a response. I'll say it. Okay. I'll, I'll say it. We, 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 can, we, should be able to, we should be able to, if we respond in less than a month, We've beaten their, their goal, so, um, okay, well, at our next meeting, Brian will brief us and uh, we'll decide whether we'll send a letter and what, what the letter should say. Is that, is, how does that sound? So we'll, that, that will be another item for our agenda for next time. We'll have discussion at that time. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, that wraps up correspondence. Um, I need a motion to adjourn. So. so second. Second.